Lily's Lair presents writer-director Ted Nicolau. Hi, Ted. Thanks for being on Lily's Lair. How are you? Hey, Lily. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. Great. Ted, um, let's get started. Uh, I'm curious, how did you get started in the film industry? Uh, I started out thinking I was going to be a doctor. Went to school at the University of Texas in Austin, and um, over time realized I didn't really want to be a doctor. Changed my major to English. Then a friend dragged me to see a couple of movies that kind of changed my life. Uh, one of them was uh, Federico Fellini's Juliet of the Spirits, and the other was um, Ingmar Bergman's Seventh Seal. And I saw those two films and uh, realized that I could do everything I wanted to do in my life in film, because I had been a musician before that and a songwriter and a writer. So uh, I quickly switched majors to uh, the film department, with a, along with a friend of mine named Daniel Pearl, who went on to become the cinematographer of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and went to school Started a little film production company with a few friends in Austin where we did like uh, training films and and um, like public service announcements and then uh, got the job being the sound man on Texas Chainsaw Massacre and thought for a few years that Austin was going to be a filmmaking capital where we could raise money and do movies. And when that proved to not be true, I ended up following a bunch of friends of mine who had uh, left Austin for Los Angeles Came to Los Angeles, uh, slept on a friend's couch for a couple of months, and got a job where a lot of my friends were working on a film called Roar, which you may or may not have heard of, but it was no. sort of the craziest movie ever made about lions and tigers starring Tippi Hedren. Wow. Um, and that, that movie, uh, I became the editor of that film for a period of time, and then uh eventually left there, started working for Charlie Band as an editor, and uh, he knew I wanted to direct, and eventually, after I paid my dues there for a while, I got my first chance. How long did, did you pay your dues for? <laughs> uh, at Charlie's? Uh, let's see. I came out to Los Angeles in 77, uh, edited um, – Tourist Trap, because uh, David Schmoller and, and Larry Carroll were friends of mine from Austin. Uh, so that was probably 78, 79. Then I uh, <clears throat> paid my dues a long time, come to think of it. I uh, got my first directing gig in like uh, 85 to do Terrorvision. Right. You also wrote Terrorvision as well, uh, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. In those days, Charlie basically uh, had a production deal where he had to make a lot of movies and his style of development was basically to come up with the artwork, the packaging that he thought he could sell and a kind of basic nugget of an idea. And then he would present that poster and that nugget of an idea to the filmmakers he wanted to, you know, draw into directing his films. And so that television was kind of like monster coming out of a TV set and I thought I could I can do that as long as I can make it a comedy. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds really cool. Um, you were you were talking about how you were going to school to be a doctor, and then you changed to English, and then you decided to become a filmmaker because you said it was all the things that you loved that you wanted to do you could do in filmmaking. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a little more on that, like your attraction sure. to filmmaking? Yeah, yeah, I told that story a little. I told that story a little out of order. So basically, oh, okay. I, I had been, a, you know, played in coffee houses and had rock bands through high school and a little bit of college. And so music was really in my blood. And I had also written songs and written books of poetry, you know, that never got published. They were just in my closet. Um, so I was kind of an avid writer as well. And uh, when I saw... And so when I switched to English, I thought I would become a novelist or something like that. And when I saw those films, first of all, Julia of the Spirits just uh, blew my mind. I mean, uh, this friend had also 
you know, giving me some LSD before we went to see the film. So, so any mind changing uh, that, that's experiences the real that blew your mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. sure it had something to do with it. <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, the the film was so powerful in its imagery, and I was sort of a like a surrealist at the time too. Uh, with some friends, we had Super 8 cameras, and we would do little crazy apparitions around campus uh, and film them. So, so uh, I was all primed to do something creative by that point. And the imagery, the use of music, the use of sound uh, in Juliet of the Spirits just blew me away. And then uh, the seventh seal, the stark kind of simplicity of the of the images, but the, power, the kind of symbolic power of everything just made me realize what an exciting medium it was. Mm -hmm. You could pretty much tell your stories and do your music and create, exactly. create your images and your visions within that. Right. right. And work with people. Yeah. And work with people, which I was doing in the bands that I was uh, playing with too. So it really was. And then, you know, once you get your first taste of being on a film crew and, and uh, being in charge of a film crew, even it just, it, suddenly it was it was obvious that that's what I really wanted to do. What kind of, what instruments do you play or instruments? Uh, guitar, guitar. Oh, guitar. Did you have, did you have actual lessons for that or did you just pick it up and start teaching yourself? Oh, uh, when I was really young, I was inspired by Elvis Presley. So I wanted to be Elvis Presley. So um, I finally talked my parents into getting me a guitar but I had to take lessons with a little old lady in in Dallas who basically taught me scales and Malaguena and didn't really teach me any any of the music that I was really dying to play. Um, so I took lessons for a while and then I just, you know, played in my room, locked the door and just played and played and played and taught myself from there. That's, I, I hear that a lot for musicians that, you know, they start out, some of them are classically trained, but a lot of them just start out and just doing their jam, you know? So it's... Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's... You kind of combine that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to you want to be able to play songs, is my opinion, when you start taking guitar lessons. Right. Do you, Did you actually, because um, I'm, I'm not really certain, did you get to do any of your own soundtrack work in any of your movies, like John Carpenter? Uh, no, I didn't. I was not quite that good or that proficient and synthesizer. I don't, I, I took a class in electronic music in school, but I'm not really proficient on synthesizer. So, so no, no, okay. there are better people uh, than me for that. There. <laughs> That's, but it would kind of be cool, you know, just pick up your guitar and put a few riffs in a, in a production. It would be fun. It would be fun. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I had, uh, when I did this little movie in Italy a few years ago, I was working on the score with uh, with the guy who had done the scores for Subspecies, and brought my son in to play guitar a little bit on that on that score. Oh, nice! Yeah, that's pretty that's pretty cool. Yeah, I read that he's a, a rock musician, so keep it in the family, right? It's yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you've worked many in many areas of film so you, you've done sound you've done editing writing directing producing is there a specific area of filmmaking that you prefer and and what do you specifically like about it uh yeah i basically you know from film school on kind of learned to do a little bit of everything um i found uh being director of photography was like not exactly my thing it's like too technical and too um too much. Uh, everything depends upon the director of photography. Uh, I ended up focusing mostly on <clears throat> editing and directing. And directing, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> was my first love. But uh, it's harder to get jobs as a director. And at that time, it was easier to get jobs as an editor. And I found that uh, editing for me is like a really beautiful process where you're you're kind of shaping performances and shaping the storytelling in a kind of shot to shot linear way um and it's like a grand puzzle trying to make 
you know, the, the emotions, the performances, the imagery kind of flow in a rhythmic and um, kind of inevitable way. And for me, that's like a, a great pleasure. And to this day, I still love editing. Um, but directing for me is to be able to tell a story starting with nothing and kind of design shots and bring the camera to the performances and um, scout locations and work with people and work with all the artists that you have to work with to make a film. To me, that's like the most exciting of all. Yeah, you're the you're the second filmmaker that I've just spoken to in the last couple of weeks that pretty much said the same thing. They oh, really? Editing, they love that. Yeah, they love that whole process. But directing, you get to pick your, you know, you get to go looking for locations. And so, yeah, it was, it, he pretty much said the same thing that you did. So oh, that's cool. interesting. Yeah. I mean, you're like basically walking a, a high wire when you're directing every day, the you're battling against time and the elements and the, the um, kind of the, the slowness with which the whole machinery works. So it drives you crazy, and sometimes you, you think you hate it. But at the end of the day, when you kind of make your day by some means, uh, it's there's nothing more satisfying. And you also have to watch the budget, too, as the director, don't you? You just have to make sure. That yeah, you definitely do. You have to be careful not to overspend. I mean, my attitude, especially working with Charlie, where the budget, budgets were never enough anyway, my attitude was if you go over budget, and but you give them something good, you'll be forgiven eventually. But if you come under budget and give them something terrible, it's that's a much worse fate. Yeah. I, my my granny always told me that it's better to ask for forgiveness than ask permission. <laughs> In some cases, that is true. <laughs> In some cases, yes. So, uh, in 1986, in your movie Terror Vision, that's another. It's considered another cult classic. Do you do you feel that making this film influenced the way that you make other films? Uh, yeah, but more like as a negative barometer of what to do in the future. Basically, uh, I made Terror Vision. Uh, I was kind of a smart aleck. And when Charlie proposed the idea to me, I kind of had edited a number of films for him. I knew kind of the, the limitations of what you could accomplish given the budgets and the schedules. And in those days, the budgets and schedules were vastly larger than they are at, at full moon the, today. But wow. I also knew the limitations of John Beekler and his uh, creature effects makeup crew. Um, and so I told Charlie, I, I, I'd do it, but asked him if I could do it as a comedy. And to his credit, he agreed to that. And uh, so I set out to make the most kind of scathing satirical comedy that I could. And yet still pay homage to the to the films that I loved when I was growing up. And basically, something went awry with that film where uh, the, the vision that I was trying to achieve with the uh, kind of off-puttingly over-the-top performances and uh, trying to make the characters of the family kind of uh, unlikable so that you wouldn't be so heartbroken when they got slaughtered by the creature. Um, mm -hmm. In the course of that, I sort of forgot or had not learned yet, I guess is really the, the trick that uh, filmmaking is really an emotional uh, process. And, and the only way to really uh, hook an audience is through their emotions. And what I was working on was kind of a, Brechtian kind of uh, off-putting characters. So uh, the I finished that film and we screened it and people liked it. Some people hated it. And uh, when it hit the theaters, it was such a monumental disaster that it kind of shook me for a couple of years. Uh, and what I learned from that was basically what I said about emotion, about telling a story that's that's kind of honest and uh, appealing. And so I tried to incorporate those lessons into, you know, I was like, am I ever going to get a chance to direct a movie again? And when I did, I tried to 
take it a little bit more seriously. Okay. That makes sense. And and I, I do want to touch on Charles Sand in just a couple of minutes, but I, sure. I've got a question that I was wondering about. In Savage Island, you wrote oh, and directed God. as you wrote and directed as Nicholas Beardsley. Why did uh-huh. what was the reason behind that? Was there a uh, reason? Yeah, working uh, for Charlie, there was always the offers that he would make you to do a film that you really did not want to do, but mm-hmm. you'd do it just because it was a challenge or because you needed to work or whatever. Uh, Savage Island uh, came to me through, uh, like he had had bought the rights to a couple of you know women on Prison Island movies that made no sense. And he wanted to combine those two films into one that would tell a story and then shoot the kind of framing story with Linda Blair. Uh, And so for me, the hook was, okay, I get to shoot this framing story. Yeah, I'll do whatever I have to do. And uh, but I didn't want my name associated with it because I just it all seemed too too cheesy to me. Um, So I took the name of uh, my cat Beardsley. And uh, a little bit of my last name, Nicholas, and uh, use that as a pseudonym. I've used a it's few a good, pseudonyms in my life. Yeah, that's that's a good one. I like that. The, the story <laughs> about your cat. That's cute. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> you so so Ted, you've made horror films. You've made the your sci-fi comedies, even a western comedy, and some documentaries. Do you have a favorite genre? that you prefer to work in? Um, you know, uh, I like horror, you know, there's, there's reasons why I like different genres for different reasons. Uh, and, uh, I, I guess, uh, I, I'm most comfortable working in horror and I like the fact that, uh, horror films are so dependent upon atmosphere and mood and mm-hmm. the, the way they're shot and the places that they're shot in. And those things really appeal to me about horror films. Uh, I did a number of kind of children's fantasy films when uh, Charlie Band, you know, formed his Moonbeam label. And those I really loved because, A, I kind of see myself as a fantasist. And B, uh, working on movies for children is makes you feel very positive about the world. And so uh, when we were doing like Dragon World, it, it just felt so right and, and like such a beautiful experience. So for those reasons, I like those two genres. Um, the documentaries are sort of in the last 10 or 15 years ended up doing a lot of little documentaries and some things for Disney company for the, the DVD releases of Disney classic films. And for the uh, yoga community called Ananda did a documentary for them or a semi documentary and uh, documentaries are super challenging from a storytelling point of view and an editorial point of view. And so those are interesting. Plus it's, it's fascinating to be able to kind of uh, dive into a world that's foreign to you and documentary filmmaking allows that. So I'd have to say I really love documentaries, too. So I guess in, in order, it would be horror films, uh, fantasy films for all audiences, documentaries, number three. Is is that why you got involved with uh, Happiness, the movie The Happiness? Uh, uh, finding know. Happiness. Finding yeah, Happiness, that was, right. Yeah, that one was a weird one for me. Uh, basically, my friend Roberto Bessi, an Italian producer who was the production executive on TerraVision was also, oh, I didn't mention the Lucky Luke. You did, though. The Western comedies. He was a, yeah, a network executive that was in charge of Lucky Luke, the Western comedies with Terrence Hill. Um, he had hired me to direct a couple of those. And that was a, you know, summertime shooting in Santa Fe, New Mexico with an Italian crew and just the spectacular locations. And uh, I love that experience, too. That was like two of the best summers of my life. Um, but uh, uh, so Roberto Bessi had hired me on those. He met in the year 2011 or something uh, a man named Swami Kriyananda, who was the head of the 
of the Ananda communities. And they're like a spiritual community that started in Northern California and then spread out to little satellite communities around the world, kind of based on uh, Paramahansa Yogananda's uh, uh, philosophies. And so Roberto met him. He wanted to do a movie about uh, the communities. Roberto recommended me uh, for the only reason I can think of is because I was doing these Disney films at the time, and and Swami loved uh, loved Bambi, and also because he knew that kind of the, my essential personality would be able to get along with these people. So I spent quite a bit of time, you know, just going in and meeting with Swami and meeting all of his uh, his leadership, and they were very suspicious of me because of my horror background, um, but. One day when somebody said, but Swami, he's done horror movies. Swami said, that's ah, okay. I liked Vincent Price. So uh, so I was in with Swami. He liked me, and gradually they warmed up to me. And so I kind of spent probably about a year just learning about their community and hanging out at their community. And um, then we ended up making this movie that uh, – they wanted to do kind of semi-fictional uh, about a journalist who comes to their community and learns kind of all their philosophies. And I kind of envisioned it as like a self-portrait where of their community, where they would kind of explain their principles to this journalist. And it's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, some people think it's kind of an infomercial and I suppose it is because it's them talking about their community, but it's also very kind of uh, beautiful, philosophies that they express. So uh, I think it turned out to be a pretty good film. That sounds like a very, very cool experience. It was, and, it was. And then, of course, your documentary on Dolly and Disney, two of my favorite people. Oh, yeah. Love them. So that was, was the, that was a wonder. That was a great experience, too. I, basically, I'd been doing these, um, you know, bonus features for Disney and the, the Disney exec who, uh, was in charge of the DVD productions, uh, came to us with the, this documentary that a couple of other companies had not been able to crack the the actual story or how to present the documentary. So I jumped on it because I loved Salvador Dali as a college student. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Disney, of course, has kind of influenced my childhood. So I jumped on that opportunity, did the kind of got the movie in shape. And uh, it's such a great story, too. And then a few years later, uh, they asked me to curate the exhibition at the Walt Disney wow. Family Museum and the Dali Museum uh, based on that story, the friendship between Walt Disney and Salvador Dali. So then wow. I spent about two years kind of curating this exhibition with like 300 objects and art from all around the world, which was a really, you know, outside of my normal experience kind of thing, but was really fun process. Was it a traveling exhibition or was it? It uh, played at the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco for six months and then it moved to the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida for another five months. But after that, it kind of, that was it. That was the kind of what was intended were those two venues. Oh, Wow. Did, did you enjoy doing that, though? You felt kind of out of your comfort zone, but did you like it? What, did you learn anything from that experience? Uh, yeah. I mean, basically, it was out of my comfort zone. I um, loved the people at the Disney Family Museum who I was working with and the, the show designer who kind of, like, picks the colors and designs the way the layout. Worked with her very closely and loved her a lot. And um, the it was a big hassle and a lot of details and a lot of tracking down ownership of certain things. Um, so it was, it was hard work. It was really hard work, but, the but I sort of envisioned it as a experience where the guest would kind of be walking through a movie. So they let me produce a bunch of, um, audio, uh, clips for it and video clips. So it was a kind of a multimedia thing. So, uh, it even though it was outside of my world, it was really interesting. I sort of learned that, you know, the world of movie making works a lot faster than the world of museums. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a cool experience. Now, I said I was going to talk about 
Charles Band, and I am. Um, you've okay. done a number of pro- you've done a number of projects with Charles. What was your favorite project, and why? Oh wow, let's see. Uh, there's always for me. It's not like one thing. It's like different things for different reasons. I guess mm-hmm. my favorite. Uh, horror films that I did for him. I mean, I love Terravision, even though it was kind of a, a humongous disappointment in my life. I love Terravision, and I and I can watch it to this day and still kind of get swept away by it. And I loved working with Mary Warnoff and Garrett Graham and all the cast in that film, Diane Franklin and John Grise. Uh, Terravision, I love. Subspecies, uh, for me, was where I became a, a filmmaker. Um, battling the the incredible hardships of Romania to make that film, and uh, the hardships of Romania, and uh, stubborn and difficult actors, and uh, shooting with a crew that barely spoke English, all of the challenges of that were like drove me insane, and were really difficult, and. Um, and, you know, threatened to derail the production at every turn. But when it was over and I was back home, I was like, wow, that was an amazing experience. And um, love the people that I worked with, the Romanian crew um, to this day. So so Subspecies and the and the three sequels, I think, were – plus I love Anna Sove and Denise Duff. Anna is a, a dear friend after being like a complete – madman on the on the first subspecies he sort of we kind of like reached a truth and a peace and were able to go on and become dear friends um so subspecies i love the of the children's movies i'd have to say terrorvision i'm not terrorvision uh, uh dragon world for me was probably the most emotionally satisfying and uh beautiful film that i got to make in all of those films with charlie uh-huh. Now, getting back to, to subspecies, um, because that's, that's a big aspect of what I wanted to speak to you about. Um, sure. How did that project get started? I know that Charles, that, well, according to sources, because I've heard some conflicting things, Charles uh-huh. Band came up with the original idea for subspecies, but then the original subspecies was written, not written by him. And did you, but then when the second one and the the additional franchise happened, are you the one that fleshed out all the ideas and build on it and create the whole subspecies universe yourself? Or how did all of that come about? Okay. It came about something like this. Uh, Charlie had, you know, in his development process, commissioned a script based on this poster of a vampire and the beautiful girl victim being kind of carried away by a bunch of little subspecies. Um, and he had a writer named David Pabian uh, write the script. And the script was okay, but not great. Um, and uh, and then at the same time, Charlie was always looking for the cheapest places to shoot a film that would give you the most production value. And uh, about that time, uh, a guy named Jan Ionescu, who was a Romanian expatriate living in the States for 10 years, uh, just it was 1989, just after the revolution uh, that kind of overturned Ceausescu and, and Romania was now like open for business, looking for for uh, opportunities. So this guy, Jan Ionescu, met with Charlie, convinced Charlie that Romania would be a great place to shoot this vampire movie. And so Charlie, you know, went to Stuart Gordon and, you know, who was his like number one director. And Stuart said, nah, I don't want to go to Romania. And uh, so he asked me to go and at least check it out for a week and see what I thought. So I went over to Romania met uh, Vlad Paunescu, who would be the cinematographer, and Juana, who is now his wife, who was who's a brilliant costume designer. And Vlad didn't speak English, but Juana spoke pretty good English, and so we were able to communicate that way. I really liked them a lot. They took me to some locations that just were so spectacular, and the thought that I could make a movie in these locations with these people who are 
you know, seriously consider themselves artists uh, was really attractive. So we uh, came back a couple of months later, the cast came and we did the film. Um, when I got back, we, we edited it, Paramount liked it a lot and asked for some sequels. Uh, oh, in the course of producing the first one, I got my friend uh, Jackson Barr um, to do a rewrite on the script, and he brought in the idea of the bloodstone, which is like kind of a key element to the subspecies universe. So uh, Paramount liked the film, asked for some a sequel, and Charlie proposed that I'd go back and do shoot two back to back. And at that point, I took over uh, scripting and basically kind of added mummy and carried on with the subspecies world until uh, the the number four. Now, I talked to David Gunn, and he told me uh-huh. to, he, he told me, first of all, to ask you about Anton. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, because he was telling me a story, well, he briefly told me a little bit that, you know, Anton, he kind of had this, seemed like he was this really mean guy, but he really wasn't. So I'll ask you about Anton. Anton, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, An- Anton is uh, Mihai Dinvali, I think, is, is um, isn't he? Uh, I mean, I have to look that up. I'm pretty sure that Anton was the gay uh, vampire, right? Is that who he's talking about? Uh, he's talking about the cameraman, Anton. Oh, I the cam- oh, Adolfo. Oh, Adolfo. Oh, my God, Adolfo oh, Bartoli. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I got, them <laughs> I got the two characters mixed up. Okay, yeah, Adolfo. Okay. Sorry. Adolfo. Yeah. Okay. So Adolfo Bartoli was an Italian cinematographer who was real old school Italian who had learned from, you know, Dante Spinotti and like, you know, the great, um, the great Italian, uh, Italian filmmakers. And he, Charlie, the one thing that Charlie Band always insisted upon was a good cinematographer. He had Mac Allberg at first, and when Mac went on to start doing the Hollywood features, he found Adolfo Bartoli. And Adolfo could light like a genius. Uh, and for that particular film with David, we uh, it was called Vampire Journals. We, uh, Charlie ran out of money when Adolfo and I were there in pre-production. And so we had a lot of time had like three or four weeks to just look at art books and go back and visit the locations again and again and talk about the look of the film. Adolfo was like a madman Italian too. He was had the biggest heart you can imagine, but the biggest kind of infuriating sense of the camera is the most important element on the stage. And so he could light beautifully, but you had to wait until the light was ready. So many times you'd end up kind of like getting compromised by the end of the day because the lighting took so long. But when you saw the dailies, it was like, wow, that's, especially with Vampire Journals, I think that was like kind of the apex of his lighting. Um, But he was, he, you know, he was Italian to the core. And so we would finish a shooting day go back to the hotel and clean up and then we'd have to go out to an Italian restaurant every night. And so I, I ended up just kind of hanging with him quite a bit. And um, he's, he's definitely a great guy, but he can be scary as hell too. And if the actor misses his mark by an inch, they would hear about it from Adolfo. Wow. But who came up with the whole, the shadow? What I thought was really cool was, you know, you would see the shadow this big shadow just moving across the building and then you would see the vampire show up. It was just like, it was almost like they were coming out of being a shadow into their physical form. Was that something you came up with or was that? You know, I don't remember it being in the screenplays at first, but I, I can't be sure, but I think that was uh, something that, that, uh, I came up with uh, when we were shooting for to, to, for Radu to get from place to place, and then the Italian crew, with their ingenuity, figured out 
how to make it work because it required putting the actor on a dolly and the dolly at a particular angle to the big light that was lighting up the building and then somehow coordinating the action of the dolly with the uh, uh, action of the of the light it was it was quite an ordeal and i think we per, got better at it over the next couple of movies yeah i was the first time that i watched um the dracula movie i thought when i saw the shadow with gary oldman and it did the whole shadow thing i thought oh they ripped that off from, from the family yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know i think we might have both ripped it off from some earlier yeah. vampire movie in the end you know <laughs> Yes, but possible. I felt that I felt that when Gary Oldman licked the knife blade uh, or the razor blade with the blood on it, I felt like they must have seen uh, subspecies too. But who knows? <laughs> That's who knows. David also said that uh, Romania is like a second home to you. Is is why is that? Is it because you have so many connections there now, or? Uh, yeah, basically because I went there in 1990 and, uh, met, uh, Vlad and Juana and then went back over the next 10 years. I spent probably three months a year there or sometimes more doing movies, uh, did like probably 15 movies there or something. Uh, and always with Vlad, uh, uh when he moved from being cinematographer to being, you know, the owner of Castell Films. Um, and so for me, the place that was so barren and difficult to live in at first became like this kind of amazingly attractive place where the actors are amazing. The people are really incredible. The, uh, the food is not that great, honestly, but, um, but, other than that, you know, just the, the sense of it's like being in 1920s Paris almost uh, back in the 90s, at least, uh, where the artists were like this very tight knit group of people who were basically, you know, theater was was really popular back then and is still popular to, to this day. And the, the artistry of the actors and the the sense that artists have a mission in life was something that was sort of like foreign to the Hollywood way of thinking. So for me, that was really seductive. And uh, my wife and I went back there last September for the 25th anniversary celebration of Castell Films. And they, they flew us out there and had a gigantic party on their back lot. So yeah, I mean, Vlad and Juana are some of my dearest friends. They basically kind of kept me sane in the whole course of making subspecies number one just by kind of being my friends and giving me a place to come and get drunk with them when when things were going difficult <laughs> yeah it's it, romania seems like a very darkly romantic place you know it's, that's exactly it yeah it's sinister in some respects but you know just full of joy and and crazy drunken joy you know the the you go up into the mountains and the peasant restaurants are incredible and the gypsy music will make you cry yeah there's just something about it that's very and now uh because it, it has so much unspoiled land and agricultural land you know you can go there and eat some of the best you know meat that you can find the uh, Tomatoes were always the best tomatoes ever. So there's a lot to love about Romania. Yeah, it, it totally has a different feel than like Western Europe, completely Eastern Europe is so different than how Western Europe is. So it, yeah, absolutely. It, I, I'm, gl I'm glad that you guys got to actually film, film the movies there because I think if you had done it in America or even in like Germany or somewhere like that, you know, I don't think it would have had the same overall feel. I yeah, you're right. You're it right. It would have been complete. It would have been a completely different franchise, I think, if you hadn't done it there. So. Yeah, for you. sure. And I think we kind of help. ruined it. But what's what, that? Why did? I, I said thank we, you. Up with all the how. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was. You know, uh, if anybody ever sees me at a horror convention, I'm selling my uh, journal. I kept a journal just to keep from 
going completely insane uh, on the first one, I realized I'd better start writing down what happens every day to keep myself focused and, and turn all the difficulties into humor just for my own personal benefit. So I kept a journal every day that basically chronicles everything that went on day by day throughout the whole pre-production and production of, of subspecies. Very fun read. Uh, was that my pitch. just for the first, just for the first movie or was it uh, just for the first movie? Things? I wish I had kept it for the second and third, but uh, the first one was quite enough, you know. <laughs> what did, did you have anything to do with the film I Vampire that Denise Duff directed and starred in? Uh, no, I did not. No, she um, found those people on her own and they asked her to participate in that film. You know, that was good for uh, her that she did that. I, just, I wasn't sure because it was all in with the subspecies information and that there really wasn't much info on that. So I just wanted to check because I know that the, you know, the vampire journals, uh, what happened with, you didn't make a sequel to the vampire journals. Is there a reason that you did? Uh, or I you just think um, the uh, vampire journals could have stood to have a sequel. And I really liked working with the cast of that film. And I felt like, um, you know, we sort of hit a stride in the, in kind of the, the overall mood of the vampire movie, but, that was about 1997, I think, and and Empire Full Moon was kind of going down, and uh, Paramount kind of came in and shut everything down. So whatever opportunity we might have had kind of got squashed with the collapse of Full Moon. Wow. Okay. Would you consider doing another one? I'm see now I'm jumping ahead, but I'm a little I'm a little curious. Would you consider? Yeah, I would definitely. Movie? Yeah. We're talking to Charlie about the possibility of doing a subspecies prequel, uh, which Ooh. we have the script for. Um, but, uh, you know, just now it all depends on getting the budget together. And I'd love to do another Vampire Journals because that would be really terrific, you know, to work with David again and mm -hmm. Jonathan Morris and Kirsten. It, you, you went more for a Nosferatu look with Radu. Did you have a particular reason for that? Were you the one that came up with the design concepts of him or? Yeah, basically I, at that time felt like a vampire should look more like Nosferatu. To me, that's the monstrous vision of a, of an, un, of a dead, undead thing. And so I didn't want, you know, I, I was never much of a vampire. You know, I didn't like Dracula movies all that much. I was more of a Frankenstein kid. So, the idea of a dapper vampire really held no appeal for me. Uh, and I liked the, you know, I was a famous monsters of film land kind of kid growing up. And so the idea of, of um, expressionism, cause I never saw cabinet of Dr. Caligari except in photographs in, uh, in famous monsters of film land. And the, the makeup of Nosferatu just seemed to me like the most horrific thing imaginable mm -hmm. yeah and and the other thing horrific too speaking of radu i and i have to ask this whose idea was it to have that continual slimy blood drool <laughs> coming out of the mouth that, and how did how was that effect accomplished because i swear <laughs> I, I love subspecies that i watched that and i'm like that is so how gross how can anders tolerate how does he do that <laughs> you know uh i think that came about because uh upon the first you know the first time that honest bit into a victim's neck and kind of released the blood that was in his mouth and then kind of drew away from the neck and in his kind of ecstatic uh reverie you know just let the drool come out of his mouth it was just the bloody drool of the blood uh, once he did that and we were like, oh, that's gross. And then we did, we tried a couple of takes where he didn't have blood coming out of his mouth. And it was like, what the fuck? That just looks too clean. So, right. so from then on, I just encouraged him to, uh, to not be a fastidious eater, you know? And honestly, was that, oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. 
uh, Anas is like such an amazing actor who gives himself over completely to the role, you know, that he, he took the, the little instruction, you know, he preens his fangs. And I say, you know, it's kind of like a cat doing his, his uh, teeth. And, and uh, so he took that and made it like a unique gesture and the bloody drool, even though some people really hate it, it was, it was the only choice, man. Once you saw him without drool, it was like, nope. Okay, you were going to say something? No, I was just, how did you, how did you actually, how was it made? Was it like the typical old style um, corn syrup and dye or how did you get Yeah, I'm sure it was like, uh, you know, the, the, the makeup effects guys came with big bottles of it. I'm sure it was like corn syrup and red dye and um, water or something like that. It was sweet How did you feel about sugar. that? How did, how did they feel about it? About it? No, it was how did pretty you feel about doing it. How about do doing it? Out? Yeah, yeah. Oh, honest was like, uh, you know, he he would do anything that that was necessary to make it work. You know, um, everybody seemed, you know, nobody ever really complained about it too much. The only time I put something in somebody's mouth that really they they had a adverse reaction to was in in um, terror vision when John Grise, when the monster kind of like uh, kills John Grise and like the little thing shoots out of his mouth and starts spewing green slime into John's mouth, uh, <laughs> it kind of choked him and <laughs> it was like puking and coughing it up for a little oh, while afterwards. <laughs> but the, the, you know, mouthful of sweet blood sugar is, you know, the only, oh, and then the, the only other time that that kind of like backfired was when Jan High Duke, as Lieutenant Marine in Subspecies 4, had to eat that little rat because he was so starved for blood. They made a rat, um, you know, vision, uh, makeup effects guys made a little rat <laughs> when High Duke picked it up. <laughs> The whole idea of it, like, revolted him so much that he started gagging. So, that, oh, you know, no. I'm, I, I, you sort of have to be, if you're directing things like this, you sort of have to be a little bit, like, cr not cruel, but you don't, you can't be too sympathetic. You sort of have to just close your eyes and go, okay, do it. You got to do it. Let's do it. Yeah, we can't make it out of cake, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got to make this look realistic. Can't make it yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And most actors, um, uh, you know, want that. Want that too. Yeah, yeah. They get it. Uh, in your opinion, Ted, do you think that subspecies opens up the vampire genre to future filmmakers as an option over the hot, sexy Anne Rice vampires? And if so, how? Uh. You know, I don't think subspecies pr probably reached enough people in its beginning stages to to mm -hmm. for me to claim credit for any uh, uh, game changing kind of things. I think subspecies uh, is part of a really long line of vampire movies, and um, you know, the success of Twilight, you know, after subspecies proves that there's like a whole other group of people who really want their vampires to be beautiful and sexy and get wrapped up in the romantic storyline. So I think if subspecies did anything, it just sort of uh, kind of created a storyline that, that could sustain over multiple films and created an indelible vampire in Radu, which I think, I, I do think he's like one of the better vampires in cinema. And, a, and an incredible kind of vampire heroine in uh, in Michelle, that played by Denise oh. Duff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because she was so sympathetic. You felt so sorry for her and all. She was just long suffering. You know, it was yeah. it was very well done. The writing, the <laughs> acting, it was just. It really was. It really was great. Of the subspecies movies, uh, which was your favorite one? Oh, I think probably just as a as a movie achievement, probably number two, uh, because I think we, the, the story sort of was compelling 
Uh, and and number three, I think I like also because even if it's a little bit slower, I think it's more psychological and you sort of get a little bit more into the character of Radu. So I have to say, a subspecies two is my favorite. Uh, vampire journals I love also because it's so elegant, but subspecies for just a rude and kick-ass vampire movie, I think number two. Okay. If you were to redo subspecies today, like any of the movies, what would you do differently and why? Oh, I would. I think I've learned a little bit more about pacing and about, you know, uh, I think in the days of Charlie Band, uh, the development of those movies, the uh, the thing that kind of held us back in some ways was the the development process was not long enough, and so and because the schedules were so short, they ended up having a lot of dialogue and not so much action. And then when you'd go to shoot the film. Uh, You'd spend so much time getting the dialogue done that by the time you got to the action scenes, you had like a day to shoot them. And, and so the, the ratio of, of your shooting expenditures was kind of out of whack. So I think if I were to do those films again, the pace would be a lot more contemporary. Mm-hmm. Okay. I got it. Well, well, now I know that you said that you guys are kind of, got a script and everything for a prequel to subspecies, but would you guys, or would you, or Charles, and you can't answer him, but would you ever consider letting someone else continue with the subspecies film? Uh, You know, like, take it up and redo it? You know, uh, I mean, it's really not my decision, because I'm not, I don't own them. Charlie owns them. Mm -hmm. And right. if he decided to sell it like he did the Puppet Master franchise, um, I presume nobody would ask me. Yeah. But I think, right. uh, you know, I don't think subspecies works without Honest. And maybe you could find another actor who could do it. Um, but it wouldn't be subspecies. It would be something else, you know. Mm-hmm. And you'd have to shoot it in Eastern Europe somewhere because we've – tried to imagine a film that you'd shoot here in the States and it just feels wrong. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I can see why you would think. So that. I'd be sad if somebody did the movie without me, but it's, <laughs> that's the way it goes, you know? Yeah. Is Radu really dead? <laughs> uh, I think he is after subspecies four. Uh, I mean, he okay. could always come back, but the head being burned kind of, puts that pretty much out of the question. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, you can always try to do something with ashes in 30 days of night. She took the ashes and he came back. Wow. Yeah, okay. So there's always a way for Radu. I mean, he's not just a yeah. vampire. He's a wizard, too. Yeah, he's he's, he's magical. He's like uh, something like that. I don't know. I just was, So I was just wondering if Radu's really dead because, you know, sometimes – Think? <laughs> I think he lives on in, in Michelle at this point. <laughs> and the prequel would be a really great story. It's a, it's a good story about how he came to be who he is and how he came to be obsessed with somebody like Michelle. And um, it would be a, a good addition to the, to the series. Would Michelle be in it? Yeah, she wouldn't be playing Michelle. She'd be playing some character in the distant past. Oh, Okay. All right. So is that what you're currently working on? Or are you working on anything else that you could tell us about? Yeah, I have a, a supernatural thriller that I'm trying to get made, um, trying to raise the money for, called uh, The Girl by the Lake, that that uh, is really a good ghost story. Um, so you might look for that in the next couple of years. Oh, good. There's not enough good ghost stories out there, I don't think. So, yeah, I think yeah. a good ghost story is always, you know, always welcome. Do you, would would you consider doing that one in Romania? Uh, I would. It's sort of set in uh, at Caddo Lake in Texas, which is this unique geography that's I don't think you find in Romania of like a forest kind of buried by a swamp. So 
you can ride your boat through kind of channels of forest. Um, and it has a, a primordial kind of look to it that, that really suits this story. But I would definitely consider shooting, you know, some slightly varied version of it there in Romania. I'd, I'd shoot anything in Romania if I could. Cool. How has being the writer and or director of so many cult favorites, because there are quite a few, how has that affected your life? Uh for the <laughs> for the better, I guess in many ways, uh, television was a big disappointment when it first came out. But the the people that that got the humor of it and uh, turned their friends on to it kind of gradually built up this um, base of fans. And then the difficulty in even procuring a copy of it, you know, after all the VHS copies had worn out, gave rise to the to a bunch of bootlegs. And then when Screen Factory put out the, the Blu-ray version of it and, and you could see it in widescreen, uh, suddenly more and more fans. And so it's always cool to meet people who were affected by that film because really there are a couple of films that affected me when I was a kid that I saw on TV and, and they were just so unique and weird that, uh, that they stuck with me. And and I sort of intended television to be that same sort of experience for, you know, 12 and 13 year old kids watching TV and catch that movie and go, what the hell was that? So so it's great. Uh, it, it's been satisfying to see that that movie still is finding new uh, new audience. And, you know, even if some people hate it, you know, the people that love it kind of overpower that and the subspecies films, same thing. They were. They were, I guess, pretty popular, pretty good sellers when they first came out, so that was satisfying. But then to see that the people that love those films watch them again and again, and, and uh, it's it's amazing to meet the people that like the work that you've done. It's to me, it's real humbling and and uh, and really cool to see that you've affected people. Because I guess that's why we got into the business in the first place, really. Right, right. Do you have any parting words for your fans? Uh, yeah, uh, Anas and Denise and I are going to be at uh, Crypticon in Kansas City in a couple of weeks, J uh, July 14th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. Uh, if you're anywhere nearby, please come see us. We'll give you a good time. Uh, and, uh, yeah, keep spreading the word about television and subspecies. Please turn your friends on to those films. Great. Thank you, Ted, so much for being on Lily's Lair. Thanks for having me, Lily. That was really fun talking to you. Great. 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 Fun talking to you. Great.